I'm Shomi Bay with Sean's Outdoor Adventures and in this video I want to give you the top 10 things you will need to start video in your own hunts. Obviously the very first thing you're going to need is some form of a video camera. This is a Sony Handycam. I've been using it for years. This is one of your options is a Handycam or a consumer grade camcorder or you could go professional grade but I've been producing you know, these videos for YouTube for years and people have really liked the quality and this is just a consumer grade camera. This, if you watch any of my videos over the last two years, this is the video camera that's captured it all. Yeah, baby! Woohoo! Yeah. Look at that! And I've had people write to me and say, what camera do you use uh, because the picture is so good? I don't even record at the highest high definition setting for this, um, but really what it comes down to for YouTube is the way that your editing software compresses it. So I'll talk more about that later. So the final output of how good it's gonna look like on the internet, it's not just your video camera, it's gonna also have to do with your video editing software. But to get started though, you're gonna need a video camera of some type. Obviously you wanna go HD and preferably something that records on um, a SD card or internally. I wouldn't encourage you to get a video camera that records on the tapes. Those are becoming more and more obsolete even though you'll see them you know, still for sale on eBay and stuff like that. In addition to your camcorder, type of video camera. There's also DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras. They're becoming more and more popular. That's actually what I'm videoing with right now. And they have a great advantage, especially in low light. Their sensors are so much bigger and better. Uh, but, you know, they're still coming along as far as your ability to film yourself with them because of the zoom and the focus. It's harder to control all that by yourself. Now, a couple things that I would recommend you look for in a camera is one that can be um, powered on and off or controlled by a remote. So as I said, this is a Sony and here is a remote and this is the number two thing. I, I, I would really recommend if you're gonna get into this, try to find something that's controlled by a remote. The reason is um, when you're panning, or whether it's on a tripod or a video camera arm, and I'm gonna talk about those in a minute, if you're doing it by hand here and then zooming with the other hand, you're hitting the camera and shaking it all around. With the remote that attaches right onto, and, and matter of fact, I can put this right on the tripod here and show you. Okay, so I've got my remote on my video camera arm. Now my remote, I can, you know, twist it to wherever I need it. I can power my camera on and off with this remote. Here, let me just go ahead and show you this. So. Right now my video camera, as you can see, is looking at you and it's on. I can hit this button and power it off. I can hit this button and power it back on. I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can tell it to record or not. So now when I'm panning, I can zoom and I, you know, obviously I can power this on with the remote, but when I'm panning, I can be zooming in and out and I'm getting a smooth pan here, as you can see. When you're doing both here, you're, you're shaking things. I know because I used to do that before I had this camera. Now this one is Sony exclusive, but very often they will call it a Lank remote, L-A-N-C. Um, Canon is a common you know, video camera brand. Their cheapest currently, and this could change tomorrow, but currently their cheapest video camera that'll take a remote is around a thousand dollars or a little bit more. Whereas Sony's, their, even their cheapest entry level cameras often will be able to be controlled by a remote, which is why I switched to Sony years ago. Number three would be a tripod, because maybe sometimes you're videoing somebody, you're on a ground, in a ground blind, you want a tripod, but regardless, you want a fluid head. As you can see when I'm panning here, it's nice and smooth. If you have what's called a friction head, which is what this one is, your movements are very jolty. So this one, you actually have to tighten and loosen it to make it go up and down. And I don't know if you can tell, but it like, it kind of jerks a little 
anytime I start out or end, and that's because it has to overcome the friction. Same with right to left. It just isn't smooth. And then you have to tighten this up to, to keep it where it's at. So if I'm videoing a buck, let's say, and, I, and I'm zoomed in all the way on them and then I tighten it up, it usually will drop down a little bit. So with a friction head, you don't get as good a quality of a product in your video than you do with a fluid head. So I would encourage you, um, when you're looking to get a tripod, look for one with a fluid head. Um, you might, you're going to spend a little bit more, but in the long run, it's going to give you a much better product in your video. No matter what you do, you want a fluid head, no matter what you use, no matter what brand or anything. Um, you're spending money on the arm itself and then you're spending money on the head. Look at it that way, because a lot of times, if they come with a head, they'll put a piece of junk cheap head on there just to keep their prices down. I made this uh, video camera arm by myself. I have a separate video on that that I'll provide a link to in this video that you could check out if you want to make your own. I'd say the, the arm itself, not including the head, was 20 bucks for me to make, all, all parts included. And then the tripod, I bought the tripod, I actually found them at Walmart for 40 bucks, which is amazing with a fluid head. So I bought two of those tripods and I took one of the heads off and put it on here. So if you shop around, you might be able to find a good deal on a tripod head that's fluid. In the category of tripods, uh, obviously it's not a necessity, but these Gorilla Pod heads, come in super handy, especially with your POV cameras. All right, POV stands for point of view. Very common one that most people know of is called GoPro. Now this here is a knockoff. It's not an actual GoPro, it's a lookalike. I have a GoPro in my other camera bag, um, but this one was close at hand, so I just grabbed it. So GoPro is one that's very common. Uh, I use a Sony. POV camera. I personally prefer this for the way that I use it and I'm going to do a separate video on how to video your hunt so I'll show you how I use it. I wear it as a headband and um, you, know, you basically have to turn your head in order to get the shot you know when it's time to shoot because your head's going to be turned when you're aiming with a bow that is. Um, a lot of people you know if you're just wearing it straight on when you turn your head to aim for shooting, you're videoing over here and the animal's over here. So I prefer this. Um, also, you know, it's not in an encased housing the way I use it, so I get better audio with it. Um, with this, you know, you're going to typically have a hat on. See, I have a hat here. Even with the other one, I'll typically have a hat on. Uh, and so you have your hat on and then you go to, um, you guys still need to get it off set on an angle like to the side and a lot of times depending on the way it's on your hat it can be kind of on an angle like the camera itself can droop over whether you know it or not and so I just always felt like you know filming with the GoPro was a little bit awkward plus just the way that it's all weighted up here it just is less comfortable than than this one so I mean if you're still looking to buy a POV camera this is an option and if you're going to use it to um, video the actual shot, which is what I do, then I kind of like, personally, I like this, this style where you can wear it as a headband and have it, you know, back here rather than up here. And um, this is just a little more awkward in my opinion. However, you know, with POV, I would rather have it on my head than on my weapon because like when a bow goes off, there's a lot of vibration. And so the image gets really vibrated and you don't get good footage whereas when you wear it on your hat you still can typically see the action you know, I'll give you an example right here The next really important thing for self-film hunts is these light-up knocks. I have a green one here and a red. They both work really well in low light, but I think the red stands out just a little better when there's a little bit of light out. So for that reason, I kind of prefer the red a little bit. But there's been times where I hadn't used the light-up knocks and my footage didn't come out as well. I would have got a really nice hit on video but you can't see the arrow very well 
uh, with, without the light up knocks. Well, here he is. We found him about, I don't know, what would you say, 100 yards? Yep. I also do a separate video on how I make my hunting hours. I'll put a link for that. But you can see there's white on here. I use an actual white paint and white fletches, and that helps the arrow show up better in daylight. Because during the day, these light up knocks don't show up anyway. But having the white on your arrows like this helps the arrow show up better on the video. So the white arrows, white fletches, and uh, the light up knocks, all this helps your video. The next thing that I would recommend for filming your own hunts is actually a light for at nighttime when you're filming a hunt, you shoot a deer or an animal in the evening and you track it by the time you find it, it's dark out. <laughs> if you have a little rinky dink flashlight, like it's something this size, it's not going to give you very good image quality, especially if you have more of a consumer grade video camera because it, the camera needs a lot of light to give you a decent picture, otherwise it's going to be very grainy. This particular one has um, a light built into it. It helps a lot if it's close within, you know, less than 10 feet. But I also have um, other lights that can mount on top of the camera. You can get those fairly inexpensively. And definitely having good light available to you for those nighttime shots is going to be key. Number nine would be extra batteries and extra SD cards. You know, hopefully you're going to have a camera that will take SD cards. So having extra of both is good because you could be out hunting and your battery's getting low. You could quick swap it out for a new one and that way you don't risk, you know, getting the hunt of a lifetime on video because you ran out of battery. Same with SD card. Your SD card could be filling up. If you have extra ones on hand, you can just swap it out real quick while, you know, new animals are, are coming or close to you and that'll keep you going. Alright, the next thing that I would recommend is actually a video camera bag. I've been using this bag for a lot of years and typically what I have in my bag is this camera, this video camera, this POV camera, my other accessories that I'm about to talk about, and, you know, such as my lens cleaner and things like that, and they all fit in this bag right here. And the reason why having a video camera bag is so nice is when I'm going to my spot, I'll have my tree stand on my back and I'll put this over my shoulder. I'll have my bow in hand and I'll walk to my spot. My cameras are not getting all banged up in my backpack or you know against my tree stand because this is safe to my side right here. And because you really want to take care of your cameras, you know, they're, they can be expensive. And so having a separate bag for your cameras is so helpful. And that gets me into what I would say is my bonus um, tips. So the next thing that I really recommend is a lens cleaner. And I never really thought about this until somebody gave me this as a gift. And this, you just you know, take it out and you sort of squeegee it around on your lens, makes a huge difference. You would be surprised at how gunked up the lens becomes in a short period of time. So your, your image quality will remain good or better than it would if you didn't clean it. So this goes a long way. Sure, you could use your shirt tail, but something like this is better for the lens and does a more effective job. And so getting something like this, they're pretty inexpensive. Man, it goes a long way. Now the last thing I want to talk about as far as videoing your own hunts would be audio. Audio can really make or break a video. I've seen some videos where the audio is just so bad you can't hear the person talking over like the bugs chirping and everything else because you know they're they're 15, 20 feet away from the video camera or they're yelling trying to get the audio to pick up. So you have different options. Um, you could get something like a shotgun mic to mount on top of the camera, or you could get a lapel mic. Which, I'm using a lapel mic right here, and there's different types you can get. Now this video camera will actually take um, a mic input. So I have a mic right here. This can mount to the camera, and then um, 
this will plug into the camera. One thing you need to watch for if you're buying a lapel mic is if it's a mono or a stereo jack. This particular lapel mic, I've used it for years, it's, it's an Asden. It's a decent lapel mic. The thing I don't like about it is it doesn't indicate if the batteries are getting low. And so there's been times where I've recorded whole videos using this lapel mic and then I go to play it back and the, the audio was all crackly and broken up because the batteries were too low and I didn't even know it. Ruined the whole piece of footage. Because once you plug this in, the camera no longer takes um, audio with its own microphones on something like this. Now your better cameras that have multiple jacks, yeah, they'll, you'll still get audio from like the shotgun mic or something like that. But when you're doing it this way, if this audio is no good, your whole, all of your footage is no good. So this is the um, other part. This is the part that hooks onto you and is the lapel mic. But I want to show you another option, which I'm using right now, and I'm intentionally using it so I could show it to you. This is, um, this is a little audio recorder by Zoom. It, it was like 100 bucks, and you can plug a mic into it. The mic that I'm using here is a stereo mic, so it looks a little different um, than, say, your little tiny one that I just showed you. Let me find it here. So it looks a little different than this. Obviously, I like this more, but this is giving me stereo right off the bat, and I don't have to use, I don't have to use an extra stereo jack. Now, if you take this stereo jack, and plug it sticking out of the side of this, it becomes a little bit challenging to keep it in your pocket. So, um, but you can get something like this. The, the little zoom recorder was like a hundred bucks. You could probably even get something cheaper. This was like probably 20 bucks. And then you could have decent audio. And then all you do when you're getting started, you clap. And then you, you know, in your video editing software, you line up those, um, breaks in the audio to sync it all up and then you can use either those audio clips together or mute the one on your camera and use the other one and that gets me into obviously the better your software the better your product your output can be now you know in your cheaper and even your free um, video editing softwares where it's going to hurt you the most aside from special effects it's going to be in your render for on YouTube or wherever you're rendering it for. So in my videos, like the one you're watching right now, all the video footage for this whole video is probably four or five, six gigabytes in size on my computer. When I edit this all up and I render it for on the internet, it's going to be less than one gigabyte because of the way I compress it down using my video editing software. That's going to make it upload faster and it's going to make it play easier for you to watch. The more, the, the bigger your file, the harder it's going to be for it to play back on the internet, typically speaking. So if you're, if you have viewers that have slower internet connections, your, your videos are going to be pausing all the time and buffering and, and it's going to lead to an unpleasurable experience for them. So that's where your better software is going to come into play is you're going to get better output. And in, in addition to that, where did I put my camera? Here it is. This video camera, as I mentioned, I don't even record on the highest high definition setting. And as I've said, I've had people write to me saying, wow, that picture is really crisp and clear. Uh, what camera do you use? And I use this. But I can press the footage so far down compared to what it's like on here. The video you see is not even as crisp as the way I see it on my not even full HD, you know, for what this camera can do. And the point is your, your video editing software is going to play a role in that. If you just have free software and, and things like that, you probably won't get as good of a quality Generally speaking, I mean, you might, and it's very possible. And as time goes on and the products and, and, solutions out there for video editing improve, you know, you'll be able to, you know, get better quality output. But in general, that's where it come, you know, the software comes into play. I've been using Adobe Premiere Pro and um, I'm using an older version. They went to Creative Cloud and I don't want to pay a monthly fee, so I'm still using my 
version that I've been using for a couple years. Uh, I've also used Sony Vegas, which I really enjoyed. If you're, you know, the higher, you know, tier that you get in the Sony Vegas line, the better your, um, your rendering abilities will probably be. So there you have it. There's your top 10 and then my bonus um, suggestions in thinking about video editing software. And the last one that I'll give you, the last tip, You gotta have patience and perseverance to do this. If you're just getting into it, it's not easy. If you're doing all, if you're getting into all these, all the camera work and using a standalone camera, you have to become a different animal. It's one thing to hunt, to pick the right spot, and to get the shot at the animal. But when you're also trying to get the shot with a video camera, so now you gotta worry about where's the animal gonna be when it's time to shoot? How do I get my camera set up for that? There's a whole lot more to think about, and that's why I'm gonna do a separate video called How to Video Your Own Hunt, or How to Self-Film a Hunt, something along those lines. There'll be a link for it in the description section of this video, so make sure you check that out. And like I said, if you just wanna use POV, you can do it. Um, I'm gonna provide a link in the description section of maybe a video or two where the POV camera saved the day for me, where you know I was videoing and maybe I couldn't get the actual shot on this camera, so I had to rely on this, and you know it saved the footage. I was able to get a hit on video, whereas if I was only using this, I would not have. And I'll also show you, I'll put a link for one of the nicest bucks I shot on public land, was a nice eight point in New York. When the buck was initially coming in, I wasn't sure which way he was gonna go, so I was getting footage on this, and then I switched over to this when he got to the right position. So having both is really helpful. So I hope that video is giving you some ideas on the top 10 things you'll need, or I would suggest you having, to start videoing your own hunts. And you could always start with the basic and build your way up as time goes on. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you'll check out my other videos. Until next time, take care and God bless.